purpose of this last uh, Sorry, this session is easy. to uh, <coughs> present a recent report on Russian attitude towards China. And I think the Russian side, the Spokesman side, will appreciate reactions from China. So, uh, please. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank, thanks for joining us. And uh, I'll be presenting um, a brand new piece of research we did. Uh, just one comment. Uh, uh, this is joint effort uh, because it's very, well, it's rather innovative in methodology, and that's my part because I'm about innovation and digital research. And it also raises some important questions about China and Russia, which is not exactly my part because I'm not in politology or regional studies. So I'll, I'll cover both, but uh, I'll be more comfortable talking about the sociology and method and these type of things than about China and Russia, though I do have an opinion probably on this. So uh, it's called studying attitudes through discourse, and basically what does it mean is, oops, yeah, a bit of terminology, uh, accounts, it's about social media accounts, a post is a piece of content which you put on social media, media follows is when you subscribe to somebody on a Twitter or Facebook or something like this, opinion on leaders were counted by opinion leaders, those who are engaged in internet blogging on a regular basis. And uh, for our sample, uh, we took those who are in top 100 of Russian bloggers uh, by uh, the number of followers. And general public is everybody who is not uh, in professional media or in opinion leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Vkontakte is a social media network which is uh, Russian Facebook. Roughly, it's about the functionality of Facebook, but three times bigger in Russian than Facebook in terms of uh, number of people. Um, what did we try to achieve by this research, actually? China relations are more and more important for Russia, and it's a big issue in Russia, and everybody it looks like everybody is talking about China relations, but the question is, do they really talk that much? The second is what they really talk about and what's the context? And what are the key issues? What, are the, what is the vocabulary? What people really think? So the traditional way of, of answering these questions is you devise a questionnaire and you go to people and do opinion polling, and we'll talk a bit about it, but we have made attempt to some alternative methodology. We try to do, to reconstruct the attitudes through quantitatively analyzing the content of actual talking of the people, which in fact amounts to um, non-participant observation. It's like you eavesdrop <laughs> people talking without being part of this talk. Um, so, the presentation covers two areas, methodology and politology. And for a bit of context, the timeline of key events that we had in 2014 between Russia and China. Well, had lots of turbulence in Russia here. Then we had first visit of Mr. Putin, President Putin, to China in May. And then they signed what some media call the gas deal of the century, some huge amount of gas over a long period of time to be sold to China. Then Cherry Cars announced the assembly plant in Russia, which was quite a big business event. Then there was prime minister's meeting in Moscow and lots of business deals signed, like Russian banks getting credit from China Exim Bank. Uh, some memorandum on construction of Moscow, Beijing, high-speed railroad probably will have in some several years. Will they promise that the travel will be about within two two days? And then yes, there was a PEC summit in Beijing and second visit of Mr. Putin uh, to China within a year. 
and then they had Brisbane uh, G20, and there was also some meetings. Uh, there were also some meetings between Mr. Putin and Chinese uh, leaders in in Brisbane. Methodology. What what difference do we make to the traditional methods? Basically, this is actual opinion poll on on Russia, and that's what you get when you have opinion polls. Uh, you see that. China hugely grew in importance from 2005 to 2014, like strategic and economic partner, almost half of the people uh, consider it friendly state and ally, 30, another 36%. We don't view, and this has dropped dramatically, you can see that it dropped by three times the number of people who, who view China as a threat, as a potential enemy or rival. Um, and what's interesting is that people start to have an opinion on China. You see it decreased almost three times the number of people who don't have opinion. So everybody has an opinion on China now in Russia. Uh, do you think China will be able to replace the West for Russia? Yes, fully 24%. So 75% think that China will be replacement for uh, of the West for Russia to a certain extent. And this is actual data from October poll. But with this type of research, the question is how much research bias do you bring by presenting people with questions? And basically, do they have this type of questions in their head? Or do you force them into answering your questions and they think on completely different issues. And within this method, you cannot be fully sure that you are really researching the people's minds, people's attitude, not reconstructing your own concept and your own attitude through them, uh, through their questions. So, we tried to overcome this uh, research bias and we, well, it's a bit of statistics on the sample, so we tried very hard to make it really statistically representative, and it was rather big. So we had almost 800, 800 accounts of Russian media. We found four Chinese media posting in Russian. Uh, we had, out of the top 100, we had 41 accounts, actually all the accounts which were present in Vkontakte network. Uh, we then analyzed what we called involved publics, is those who are following media or following opinion leaders. And then we had general public. And here, one of the hypotheses we were trying to check that attitude to China changes with the distance to China. And if you remember the map of the world, we have the regions which are bordering China, and like in the city of Blagoveshensk, one side of the river is Blagoveshensk and another side of the river is China. And on the other hand, you have Moscow, and basically it's more or less the same flight Moscow to Beijing or Moscow to New York. So it's rather distant. Uh, so we had four regions, capitals Moscow and St. Petersburg, then central Russia, most distant from China, Siberia and Urals, which are more or less in the middle, and then the Far East, the border regions. Uh, yeah, we used uh, specific accounts using the usual sampling procedures, so it was random sampling. Uh, we had to boost a bit the Far East uh, part of the sample because it's sparsely populated compared to other Russia, so it's about 6 million people living in the whole region compared to 140 population of the whole country. So this part was boosted, but everything is within the statistically viable procedures. Uh, we, yeah. <clears throat> then we captured all the posts of the sample, and then we uh, took out all the posts which had something about China, meaning the word China, the word uh, CPR, Chinese, all, all types of derivatives from China. And the primary analysis was the share of selected posts in the universe, extracting keywords, and, well, we omitted 
all types of non-meaningful speech particles, and we have plenty of them in Russia. <laughs> I mean, that's the language. <laughs> and then we started to the core analysis was the intensity of discourse dynamics. Uh, tags of words, uh, clouds of words, correlations between frequencies of group of words, and trying to discover what we can call sem semantic fields, the meanings which are going together quite closely. Uh, so this is overall we had analyzed of almost 6 million posts. China related of them were 50 to 1000 and uh, it's about a bit below 1%. Uh, and but it's plenty of material for analysis. It's, it's enough for statistically representative analysis for the, all, all groups. And those were four key instruments that we had. You can analyze the relative weight. You can have the visual representation of semantics, which is sometimes much more telling than, than trying to get statistics. Then you have correlations. And then you have a uh, relative frequency of words and con concepts. I'll, it's, it's just for methodological indication. <laughs> I'll get into the contents a bit later. So um, then we used, we, using the grounded theory method, and it's, it's an interesting development because usually you go to grounded theory when you do qualitative. When you do something like focus groups or in depth, then you use grounded theory to. to, to assemble the whole thing and get into, into conclusions. But here with this type of things, it's, the analysis is very, very close to qualitative. So we used to the grounded theory, and based on this, we used clusterization of actual vocabulary. So we didn't get any research bias. We, we only analyzed what is observed, what we have eavesdropped. And then we went to experts trying to get meaning out of, of, of this analysis, <laughs> statistical analysis and ground theory analysis that we had. So what's different about our analysis from the traditional sociology? Relevance. We do th see the things which are actually important uh, in this issue. We do see weight, we do see dynamics, we do see how big or small the issue is in overall discourse. We do have breadth of analysis. We see the whole of semantic relations. We do uh, have this, what we can call, layman discourse. You, you, you do see what actual general public talks about. And you do have depth of analysis. You see all the possible connotations. And daily dynamics available. Theoretically, you can see uh, the picture almost in real time. It is not that dynamic, actually, in real time. It's, it's not very interesting, but it was one of the hypotheses that we checked. Does it have important dynamics over time? There is one minus. If you want straight answer to straight questions, no, we don't <laughs> have straight answers because we don't have straight questions. It doesn't work like, like this. How? many Russians like China. No, you can't tell this. You have to interpret it. You, it's once again very much like what you do with the qualitative. You, you see the test, you see the text, you see the verbatim, and then you interpret this. More or less the same approach in, in this case. So, but still we think it's very powerful method because you combine the breadth and subtlety of analysis which is traditionally associated with qualitative but you have rigid statistical quantification. So um, it's sort of quantitative non-participant uh, observation, which is quite a powerful potential tool. To the content. What's, uh, what, what, what to get out of it? Uh, so with a few exceptions, if we speak about media, the Russian media are not very much into Chandra. A number of champions, one has one title, quite influential one, had China in every fifth, almost every fifth publication. But 
number six has China only in three percent, and then it drops quite quickly. So most uh, most of the media they have China below one percent of of publications. Um, media coverage is expectedly strongly event driven. So you have three distinct peaks, and you can perfectly interpret them. The first one was the tragedy when the Malaysian Airways Boeing disappeared in February. Then second was President Putin's visit number one, and then it was APEC summit and President Putin's visit number two. So you clearly see how, how, how the weight of China rises. What's interesting, when you go to the general public, you don't see these clear dynamics. Uh, you see peaks which are very peculiar. For example, here they had, uh, they, they had a fake piece of news that China threatened to claim the payment of US bonds which it holds in gold. And it went viral and everybody was discussing this, though it never happened actually, but it made quite a peak in, in China discourse for general public. Then there was a bit of splash in APEC summits but not that much as in, in media. And then, for example, in, uh, in, in summer, you have a couple of peaks which you cannot interpret. And uh, from the point of view of Russia-China relations, nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened, but suddenly China has a peak in, in, in weight. If we speak about uh, discus analysis, that's the official media, and it's sort of balanced, polite, mildly political discourse. The keywords, Ukraine is, Ukraine is prominent. When you talk about China, you mention Ukraine, which is, well, you can understand it in the global political context. Um, then you have Europe, you have, on the other hand, like company, country. Um, nothing very specific. Uh, if you look at Chinese media, which blog in Russian, it's much different. It's, um, it starts to get more cultural, like universities prominent. Uh, uh, it starts to get more regional, like province is, is prominent. And this relates to China because we don't call Russian regions province. It, it, it's, it applies to China. So company work, development, um, it generally it's and it's more China centric, of course. Beijing is is the key word, or people Chinese people C CPR, yeah, uh, is is a key word. When you look at the bloggers, opinion leaders, it starts to be very politicized. You have USA as the third prominent world. I mean, <laughs> when they blog about China, they don't, they actually blog about USA, and they blog about Crimea and Ukraine, war, West, Europe, America, dollar sanctions, very little about something which will be about China itself. While if you look at the general public, it starts to get, uh, much calmer. It's not that much politics. Uh, it starts to be once again about work, some even person, city, people, country, America and USA, obviously. So what you see here is three very distinct approaches to China, in which which you view, can view now, which you can see now in Russia. One is official. Politics, more or less balanced, and with strong presence of, of business and economy. One is opinion leaders, which is very much politics, and, well, very much anti-West politics, and not so much about China, but just about anti-West. And then you have general public, which is, China is a very big country, which we happen to like, but which we know that much about. Uh, this regional hypothesis did not work out. 
practically no important differences between capitals or Siberia or Far East. The idea that we hold that probably people in Siberia will have um, more of let's say tension towards China because uh, you know it's it's a fact from um, research on, on uh, attitude of people towards nuclear uh, nuclear reactors and nuclear power stations. The closer you are to the power station, the more relaxed you are about it. People tend to be scared about nuclear power when they are some distance away. So, and we thought that probably something like this happens. People who are on the border, they know they have experience with China. People who are away from the border, they, they have more tensions. No, they didn't work. So, more or less the same uh, number, the same set of words. And it happens to be absolutely stable in time. We had, uh, here is analysis of four distinct uh, political periods. And lots of things happened between February, March, April, May, June, August, September, November. It was extremely turbulent year in, in politics, economics, etc. in Russia. Nothing happens actually in the discourse on China. Very, very static. And, well, obviously it was boosted to the importance of China. It was largely driven not by China itself, but with, by, by this split with the West. And you can see that in all the groups, uh, Ukraine, I, I mean in Russian groups, Ukraine is the second most important country. Uh, you say is the first most important country, while in Chinese media, Kazakhstan is more important than Ukraine, and for good reason, because Kazakhstan is between Russia and China, and Ukraine not. <laughs> um, and you can see this is discussion of currencies, and red one is rubble, the second one is dollar. When people talk about relations with China, they don't talk about yuan, they talk about dollar. And yuan is uh, the blue one and euro is uh, green one, they are almost equal. And what's this? In the economics, it's very much about gas. It's gas deal, not that much about oil, but about gas. Um, what's interesting that it, uh, the negative side, possible negative side of Chinese involvement in economics is, is very small. The things like fake or counterfeit, the, um, well, China was sort of infamous for it in 1990s. Now it's, it's, it's really small. And generally, we found very little negative attitudes to, to China. What, what was also a surprise, neither is a threat, nor uh, people are scared about migration, though this, it was a big issue in the early big issue in the early 2000s, like m migration from China, especially in Far East. And now it's not a threat. And economy-wise, people don't think of counterfeits or fakes or something like this. Unfortunately, very little about innovations. Um, not that much about technology, so guess, guess, guess. Um, among the Chinese companies, uh, CNPC is once again, due to the gas deal, is, is prominent. And people also know Huawei and Lenovo. Not as much as we expected. And probably the reason for this is that Lenovo and Huawei are now percepted as global companies, not as Chinese companies. When people write or blog about Lenovo and Huawei, they don't mention China. They just think of them as, as big global brands. Because definitely Huawei and Lenovo are much more present on the Russian market than you can think from this analysis. And about culture, uh, it's cinema and food. So Chinese food is something big, we know about it. Uh, cinema is on the second place and then things like book or pan, dog and food, as well as like this are not that, that much prominent. Uh, a few quotes, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, that's what we want from China, actually. <laughs> At least some part of us wants from China is uh, yeah, that you uh, 
uh, being that close as an ally. Um, yeah, so on the on the uh, this anti-Western discourse, so, uh, China and Russia have tamed the Uncle Sam's pet monkey, probably about Ukraine, uh, American boom. Yeah, then you have something uh, Chinese as an archetype, Chinese as sort of archetype for Eastern type of mindset and Eastern type of uh, behavior. Like American woman in distress will turn to a psychologist, a Chinese woman will keep it to herself, and Russian woman will go visit her mates and have a party. Um, yes, China, once again anti-Western. China has issued maps of the world where Ukraine and Alaska shown part of Russia. Uh, yeah, and some nice stories from people's life, like. It uh, also went viral that in some distant Chinese village there is a school where there is only one pupil and one teacher and they still it operates as a school. So uh, it went uh, positively viral as an example of proper attitude towards education and development. So summing up and wrapping up, um, on the methodology side, We have really a phenomenon, and nobody would think 10 years ago that people will so openly and so massively discuss rather private matters and express their intimate views open to public, and you can observe this. And this definitely opens absolutely new opportunities for sociology. You can use quantitative methods for non-participant observation, and great. You, you eliminate the research bias out of, the way, out of it. Um, yeah. On the political side, this turbulent development that we had, it led to, to quick rise of China in public opinion, which is, I think, it's a great cultural opportunity to bring the two countries closer together. Um, up to the moment, it's it's sort of shallow. Yeah? We like China, but we don't know the reason for it that much. We like China because we don't like the USA. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, but this can be great cultural opportunity. I mean, if we try to use this liking China to getting to know something about China and study China and having more deep and more uh, multi-dimensional relations on the culture, uh, on the travel, on the, let's say, uh, everyday business life. Uh, this can bring two countries really together. So that's basically it. I will be happy to answer your questions or hear the comments because it's very interesting how it looks from, from here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, one thing, when you said stable over time, um, it would be interesting, I mean, in some ways, to see, you have a table that sort of showed different mm -hmm. years, because really stable over time within a one year period yeah. is the about that many, you would think that many of the, for example, if you're talking about depth of understanding, mm -hmm. that's not going to change within the same year. Much. Yeah, right. yeah, you're absolutely Over right. Of years course. That you're going to get a greater. I mean, here you get an interest, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's interesting. But the, the interesting thing would be to, to follow that peak of interest and see if it's maintained or if it's just the result of mm -hmm. the anti-West. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely right. It's it cannot be stable or over more or less a uh, long period of time. What I I rather <laughs> meant that it's not as dynamic as you probably would expect it. What do you mean by dynamic? I mean, we had incredibly turbulent year, but when you analyze these uh, content fields from March and from November and in between, 
it's more or less the same words in more or less the same proportion. So it, this political turbulence, it doesn't change the, it, the, the discourse is more conservative than, um, not conservative, more inert than, than we would expect. Because we did expect, first we did expect the uh, upper, upper trend in the weight, which you don't see, it's, it's like this stable. And we expected the let's say, growing concentration of, of uh, this, uh, let's say, political anti-West discourse as one hypothesis, and we didn't see this, so it, it's so, unfortunately we can't, the, the problem is we can't say what happened before, what, what was the discourse before. It would be very interesting to compare this. But even if it was different, then it looks like it worked like we had an injection of new attitude towards China, and then this injection state, it's not like it was incrementally building up. But it would be great, of course, to reproduce this in a year, for example, and to see how it develops. Can you go back in time? Uh, unfortunately not. It, it doesn't work. You, we, we, you can't collect the post back in time. Uh, another thing is definitely, we, which we plan to do, is to compare it to other countries. Because it's, uh, some things you will know much more graphically when you compare it to, to, to some benchmarks. Well, one, of the, one of the differences, I mean, I used to get an email, I was in, forget, um, I used to have a regular contact with a, a journalist from Russia mm -hmm. who would always send me emails and say, this is happening, give me a comment, right? And he posted and I actually met him um, uh, when I went to Moscow. But, but he, you know, in the West, people are often very anti-China. You know, if you look at, uh, just take the International Herald Tribune. Uh, every day there's a story just about it. And, and usually it's something negative or <clears throat> slightly negative. You know, yesterday was how important Xi Jinping is becoming like Mao. And that's a kind of critique, right? So let's, let's focus on that. But I don't think you get that kind of stuff so much in Russia. No, and it was even to the extent of surprise. We, we expected more uh, of, of some negative attitudes. And once again, it's what makes this uh, method really valuable, that there are, when you have qualitative impression of the discourse, like you just read through the media, you get uh, the very strong opinions and you start to think that they are big and important. And there are people who are blogging about every day about the Chinese threat and developing scenarios. How how much hours will it take Chinese army to capture Khabarovsk and Vladivostok? And not that much, actually. <laughs> but when and when you read through this, you get impression that this is big and important and is an issue. When you do quantitative uh, for the whole discourse, you see it's very very small. People are not, there is no Chinese scare in Russia for the moment at all. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Uh, did you use your own software? And is it possible, let's say, to do a vice versa in terms of what Chinese people think or write about Russia? Uh, we did, uh, the, it, it was a joint research team, uh, so we did this together with uh, the Center for New Media from, uh, and you know Ivan, um, by the way, uh, and uh, we, the technical part was uh, powered by a professor from uh, Copenhagen University. And so he, he owned the software, now we do have it, but it's really very resource consuming. It's, it's, it doesn't work like this. One of the things we wanted but didn't achieve, we wanted to make it online, like you push the button and get the... No, it doesn't work like this, it works. <laughs> it takes a whole night to, 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 to process the, the thing. Um, and your other question was, sorry? Uh, is it possible? Uh, is it possible to do it? It would be great, but uh, Chinese and Russian are so different as languages that you can't do it with the same piece of software. So if we manage to find a piece of software which does the more or less the same thing 
and the problem is that nobody on the research team speaks Chinese, so we, <laughs> we don't know how to handle it. Yeah. Um, well, I got it. Uh, I, actually, I don't know because it's a linguistic issue. Uh, my feeling is that you'll have to develop the complete different set of software. Okay. Okay. And if I may, uh, did you check the comments to, to bloggers' posts? Yes, we counted them as posts also. Oh, okay. So uh, the professional blogger is like. Uh, it posts somebody something and then people start to comment and all those also went into the base as posts and this was within the group of involved public. Mm -hmm. And the last question for mm -hmm. me, how long did it take you, I mean the technical part and the analysis and how fresh is it? Uh, the, the freshest piece of data comes from late November, so we covered uh, a week after Brisbane, more or less, if, if you link it to, to the events that happened. Uh, we developed, well, it, it was the original piece of software was, uh, we, we took it, but it was for English, so we, we were developing tuning into Russian, and it took a couple of weeks. And then we were developing and trying the methodology, because it was not that easy to really sample because uh, it's to make a statistically valid sample you you generally want to know the universe and you don't know universe on the social media that easily so we, 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 we played with, with, with this type of things so and methodology took about a month uh, of work and then we came to something which satisfied us yeah Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a lot of Republican insiders, you know, eventually surprised, you know, how how the election actually went. Uh, but if you look at the uh, some of the polls, uh, who are pretty good, and eventually they, they are very precise in terms of you know, who went which state and, mm -hmm. uh, and all that using the database uh, method. I don't know whether that that could be potentially useful or not. Maybe you are aware of that. Um, and second, I. I I, I don't know how big it is, probably you can tell me better. In terms of like, uh, I think for Alibaba, they are, in the emerging market, they are very big. In, your, in China, you know, they're semi very big, but also, <coughs> I think in Russia and Brazil, uh, they're also number one online, like uh, merchandiser. Alibaba? Yeah. No, they just entered the market. They have yes. big plans, but uh, they are not really big for the moment. Yeah. Yeah, Taobao yeah, so is but, almost nothing. Nothing. But, uh, but, but what, yeah, but if you look at the, you know, look at the actual commerce data from Alibaba and from other places, they yeah. are uh, number one in Russia and also in, uh, in Russia. No, it is huge. Um, the is from Russia is huge. It's, it's uh, by, for example, Times, by, for example, uh, I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen the statistics which would put uh, Alibaba in the first place, uh, which, which doesn't mean that it's not there. It's, it's, it means that I haven't seen it. Uh, on, the, on what I know about the markets, um, no, it's maybe what they were trying to say that Alibaba is the biggest out of those who import into Russia. And which means bigger than Amazon, for example. This may be. Uh, the problem is, and we discussed this briefly in the previous session, that importing into Russia has, uh, due to the very ineffective mail system and complex custom regulations, it's not that much uh, part of the market that you buy online and import. It's, it starts to be messy. So, bigger players are inside the country and I don't think that Alibaba is bigger than Ozone, for example, which is the biggest Russian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things you didn't talk about, but it, 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 as a comparison, um, if, you were, if 
someone were to look at, well, first of all, there's a guy named, I don't know if you know this, there's a guy named Xiao Chang. There's this media program, internet program out of Berkeley, mm -hmm. um, who's very, very active, the most active person monitoring the Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, so you might want to mm -hmm. get in touch with him with, oh. with your work. Thank you. Um, but, but um, you know, one of the big things about China internet is maybe a third of the bloggers are actually government officials. Mm -hmm. uh, they have what they call the 50 cent blog, right? You notice that the government will pay people to go on <coughs> and make positive statements. Now, I don't know what, you know, here you're this asking happens in a Russia. question about China, <laughs> right? So, so the question becomes in part, to what extent, as you said, official, right? To what extent is the government trying at this point to present a positive image of China so as a way of alternative to the West, as you said, people now think that China can maybe save Russian, the Russian economy and this would be from official. I mean, to what extent is the state you know, sneaking this stuff mm -hmm. in um, uh, versus general uh, yeah. sort of the bloggers? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're right, and this, uh, this does happen in, in Russia. It's almost official that uh, they invest into very powerful uh, networks of bloggers and uh, people who are trying to influence social media. But those are not usually not top bloggers, because to be a top 100 blogger, you will have to post something really interested, interesting. I mean, they may be influenced, but not completely formed. The, 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 these uh, networks of, uh, let's say, paid bloggers, they usually, each of them relatively small, they, they work as a network. So I don't think that this is much of a bias in our public opinion uh, sample, though some of them definitely are pro-Kremlin and some of them, let's say, pro-Western. And what, what is interesting, it's not the uh, position they, 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 they take, but their overall attitude to the world. And actually the world in this part, it, it's very, it's not even bipolar, it's single polar. And it's, the, the pole is the uh, USA, and it used to be a not so bad pole, but started to be a very bad pole, and so we're trying to find another one. <laughs> but it's, it's not about chain, it's about this all of the world going bad. <laughs> Speaking about the outtake, I tend to, to agree with you that the, probably one of the surprises was the general public does not, uh, it does not work like something which uh, takes the content from official media and internalizes this content and throws it away. It, 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 it looks much more relaxed and much less political than you would suppose by analyzing the content of official media. Which is not a surprise if, if you remember that we had a big history of explicitly controlled and censored media. And so in the Soviet times everybody had a personal strategy of dealing with this explicitly censored content. And trying any way to get some picture of the world from something which is by definition distorted. Unfortunately, we did not compare uh, China to other countries and this is definitely in our plans because it, it will give much, much more information to us. 
find one question. What is yeah. the inter internet penetration rate in Russia? Like, how many, what percentage of the population is hosting? Yes, um, uh, internet penetration rate uh, across the country is about a bit of the question what you define as penetration, but uh, at least 79% on average in the country goes online at least once a year. If you define it as going online every week, it will be about half. As for the um, presence of social media, Vkontakte has, as far as I remember, they have about 70 million accounts, which is, well, mathematically roughly means that it's half of the Russian population. Not all of the accounts are Russian because they, you, they have some Russian speaking but other countries. But it's, it's really big. So it's, it's a legitimate question how you can be sure that what you sample on social media is representative of the general public opinion overall. Uh, statistically, no. There is, there is no way to, to, to put the strict statistic, statistical link between one. Uh, um, another good question will be whether the selection of media, social media uh, site for research will bring some type of bias because there was a theory that more liberal people are using Facebook and more pro-Western as opposed to, let's say, more uh, conservative using Vkontakte. No, uh, we, we, we didn't, uh, for, for some technical reasons, we did not uh, put Facebook into the analysis, but we had an exercise in comparing. No, quantitatively not. At least in China issues, they are pre pretty much the same as the discourse. Um. So let's, uh, thank uh, again, the speaker. And thank you.